Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. Very excited to be talking about society and tech. We have Jeremiah Oyang joining us on the show. Hey, I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. Yeah. So pumped for this conversation. Jeremiah's background is fascinating. I'm pumped to jump into things with you. Your industry reports are just some of the best synthesis of society and tech. And so I've Thanks. loved diving into them and we're gonna unpack those, uh, especially where humanity is going, which is very, very cool. Let's, uh, let's jump into things with your thoughts on the overall direction of our world. Pretty uncertain, pretty scary. Um, I think we have a lot of things to overcome. I see a lot of challenges. But uh, this morning I made a list, actually. I was thinking about all of the things we overcame in just the last 100 years. Two world wars, fascism, you know, um, re helping to repair the ozone layer, acid rain, cold war. We overcame those. So I know the challenges that are coming now we can overcome if we work together. What do you think is the, one of the most critical skills for us to embody to make sure that we can overcome the biggest challenges together? Yeah, it's thinking as a collective. And right now, we're, a lot of people are thinking as individuals. Uh, the hope is technology can help unite us, but in some cases, it's creating divisions. And, and I think that's really the opportunity. And we need to think bigger as the planet is, a ecosystem. It is our home. It's our only home. We have one spaceship. This is it. There's not enough resources to go to another spaceship at this moment in time. We got to take care of this one. That's what I think about. Yeah, it's really important for us to have at least a, uh, a strong uh, relationship between our individual self-actualization as well as the collective self-actualization mm -hmm. and harmonize mm -hmm. those. Um, okay, let's talk about you know your journey. This is going to be cool, I wonder how you became so fascinated with all of these different fields, because I myself am also super polymathic in that sense, and like, how, who were you growing up and how did you get interested in this? Oh, that's a big topic. Um, um, I've liked the arts and, you know, media, and as you know, I came into your house and I immediately started to fascinate around the musical instruments you had here. Um, I, I love that aspect, and then the just, just grew up with a lot of music in my life and uh, but I became fascinated with new topics and of course technology and then I track these things so I, I track tech trends and how they change society for the good and bad and then what do society and businesses who tend to be my customer base you know what do they do and what should they do and really that's uh, what I've done yes yes okay so I see so you kind of had these roots of of being a synthesis when you were younger mm -hmm. and then picking from different fields and trying to make a, maybe uh, valuable insights for people I think you nailed it so synthesis is what I like to do I, like literally when I see unstructured things in the world like in, in a market you know I structure them and you'll see that in my graphics by the way I don't have OCD and I'm not gonna go and clean your your house for you that's not what I do uh, but I just like to find the patterns and see if the patterns repeat. Sometimes they do, yeah. sometimes they don't, but uh, often they do when you look close enough. Yeah. Yeah, like literally, you can see like the industries replicate over and over. I've seen a couple patterns now, uh, which has been helpful, but also you see how technology replicates um, biostructures too, right? So these, these yes. are all related, right? Networks yes. are networks, whether yes. they're made out of carbon or they're made out of silicon, they're very similar. Yes, yes, yes. Wow, this, uh, it seems like it's an, uh, an imperative in nature, the formation of just like you'd illustrate in your uh, graphics, like the collaborative economy you illustrate in a honeycomb. Mm. And uh, it for a specific reason. So the honeycomb is nature's, one of, one of nature's perfect geometries. So you can put a, trim first of all, there's no wasted spaces between a hexagon cell, right? Versus if there were circles, you'd have small little uh, triangles in between them. It's wasted space. Bees ain't got time to waste space. They're very efficient. And also you can put a lot of weight on a honeycomb structure, unlike a squared boxed pattern, which would collapse at a, just a slight angle. So by design, honeycombs are one of the strongest and most efficient structures. So that's why I wanted to organize the market and the graphic around that because bees have had it right for millennia. Yeah. So there's an example of the, yes. the patterns. Yes, yes. And 
in this graphic, you go and begin showing how uh, humans have innovated in transit, how they've innovated in food, how they've innovated in health and well-being, how they've innovated in manufacturing. I mean, you show all of these different fields. And then you also indicate that a lot of the time, these corporations that are literally your clients are building very, they're eager to build innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 like innovation departments and innovation strategies that are able to connect them closer to their end customers that yeah. they're serving. So the um, and hopefully we can have some links or in show and the show the um, the honeycomb itself. But essentially the re the second part of the reason for that module is, or for that diagram is because it's it's many individuals working together as a collective. And now they're using technology. Now, so bees, they do a number of ways. They have pheromones. They also have a waggle dance. Did you know they dance? Their butts point the direction of the, the flowers and the pollen. And they actually point cer certain frequencies and the dance and the direction, which indicates the distance that the others need to go to find that. So it's this way of working together. Now, the same thing with tech. Bees shake their their, their tails. You see, that's perfect. Just like that, that is a perfect they, waggle dance. They I'll waggle. The wa they waggle, <laughs> and, and they, they rotate. That, that tells the other bees uh -huh. how far away the flower pollen. That's right. Are. And we had to invent mm. GPS <laughs> to do what they do already so perfectly to identify where is their shared house, where is their shared ride, where is their shared food, where is their on-demand products that I can borrow or goods. And, and or where can I get information? And it's actually very similar. And they're doing it peer to peer. So technology is emulating that, yeah. but the technologies we're using are mobile platforms with GPS and payment systems, and we and the GPS on a map is the same thing as a bee's doing a waggle dance. Mm. So it's a way of identifying mm. as we digitize the world where are the resources that we can share as a collective. Mm -hmm. As a result, businesses like have emerged that enable that, and the traditional corporations, which are very isolated, big corporations are isolated. They're not collaborative to the network in that space. They make things and they push them out the door. They're not as connected, but digital has forced them to connect yes. to the ecosystem. Yes. Um, and as you know, and your really smart audience and community knows that those that are connected are more resilient, they have more power, right? Duh. We, duh. duh. Yeah. So they're realizing they have to open the doors and be connected uh, to the ecosystem. And, it, and as a result, it means they're now Car companies are renting their cars or sharing their cars. They're emulating what the, coll the collective is already doing. Hotels are purchasing their own versions of Airbnb to make homes available for sharing because they know there's resilience in being connected to the community. Yes. So you can see this pattern of nature is being replicated by consumer tech, yes. which is being replicated by the stoic industries and institutions that need to follow what nature has already done. Yes, yes. So in a way, it's, uh, I don't know, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> emergent properties that, yes, yes, it's emergence that these different nodes in uh, nature independently uh, don't behave in the same way that when they collectively, uh, the hive of bees uh, collectively behave as an emergent phenomenon, just like when, you know, we individually behave completely differently than when we're together, they have an emergent phenomenon like this conversation and like a economy or a government, uh, et, et cetera. And so I, as we also describe this as nature and consumer tech, basically uh, being a uh, uh, following very similar principles as nature does, uh, and then corporations also wanting to then go like the the, the Goliaths, organic. the Goliaths, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, wanting to go and also yeah follow those similar trends. Um, I also want to bring up how. Uh, Th I think this is this is critical because we're layering in this this idea of 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 this uh, this democratized uh, future of of um, of getting a, what we want done faster, like cities, efficiencies, wealth creation mechanisms, and all of the different fields in this honeycomb lattice that you're talking mm -hmm. about. But also, you see this on like a really significant the six digital eras. Uh, trajectory as well. So can you take us through this, these earlier eras sure. and then where we're at and where you think mm -hmm. we're going? 
So yes, so a framework I created is called the Six Digital Eras, and at, at first, the first three eras were very clear to me ten years ago. Uh, so in the '90s and prior to that, we have the internet era, but it became so dominant when in the late 90s. And this is basically when the world, people are creating web pages to say, hello, I'm out there. It's like a, a signal, like, um, it's like a small infant, you know, shouting to, to, the, to the world, hey, we exist, and here's my digital signal. You know, I, I always tie this back to, to, to nature. Yeah. And by the way, those eras, when I was asked to do this report at Forrester as an analyst, I, I couldn't figure out what the pattern was, so I went for a walk at Half Moon Bay, and, and I walked past the cliffs and I could see the stratification of the, of the different la layers of soil. And I said, oh, it's eras. And so I said, it's eras. So that signal came there from that walk. So, you, you know, these are all intertwined. It's all repeating. So that's the first one is the, the internet era. Uh, the second era is the uh, social media era. And this is when it wasn't just for people who had resources and technical capability to publish. Anybody can now emit that signal. And, and the, we saw the rise of YouTube and Facebook and beyond. And the third era is this collaborative economy, which is the peer-to-peer -peer commerce. And we've seen eBay and Airbnb and, and, and Lyft and, and blockchain and maker movement and crowdfunding. And some could argue Uber does or does not fit into that, but it is enabling some, in some regards peer-to-peer -peer transactions, but that's a whole discussion. The next era, and so what we saw now is those, um, out of the third era, we saw a lot of automation emerge, right? And, and as self-driving cars and drones and AI bots were integrated into the third era, that gave rise to the fourth era, which is what we call the autonomous world. And, and that's being tested now. So the first three eras are dominant. Yeah. Th those have come and those are now part of our world. Yeah. Uh, the first one, internet era, it, it's kind of dissipated because it's been um, superimposed by the second third. Yeah. So now we're in the autonomous era. And we do see self-driving cars sometimes here mm -hmm. in Silicon Valley. And we're, we chat with AI bots frequently. Yeah. And yeah. every time we use Google search engine or Facebook newsfeed, that is, a, that is AI. Drones are flying and capturing the footage that we see in the videos. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, And there's for sure a ridiculous amount of uh, AI that is now being developed. It's eating our world mm -hmm. so fast. And it is. Um, and, and for all of these things, uh, you know, are they good or the bad? And my answer is it's fire. Fire is heat is great and it's also hurtful. It's how, we, how will the human wield it? It's fire. Yeah, yeah. So the next one is um, the fifth era is what we call modern well-being or tech wellness. And now, the, so the outer world has been digitized. Now it's coming inside of us into the in, inner space. Mm -hmm. Oops, I touched the mic. Excuse me, the inner space. And so, like, for example, this Apple Watch has many sensors on it. And there's devices. And um, it's starting to measure um, all these things. In fact, um, there are algorithms that can analyze this video and look specifically at your face right now and determine which one of the 110 micro expressions you're emitting to me right now. Yeah. And, and start to, and over time, and you publish a number of videos, could actually start to determine that and predict what is Alan gonna like or not like before you actually see something. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that, that is starting to happen, this modern well-being and determine your moods. Seeing and then, my level of tiredness, seeing my mood, seeing my, you, you literally, uh, the microvasculature. Correct. Uh, so you your can heart see your, yeah. your heart rate and the oxygen levels by the flushing of your face. Uh, th those are things that you can see the micro pulsing of the, um, that can be seen through VR glasses if there's even a, um, a camera facing you already. So yeah, the level of detail, how tired you are, how much sleep did you have? Are you receptive to new messages at this moment in time? Should I be talking to you about this or that? Yes, so yes, that can all, yes. you know, eventually your brain states, right? And I've seen tests of that at totally. certain conferences. Like literally a full uh, chemo electro connectome and your full biometrics of your heart gut all uh, being streamed up and processed and, mm -hmm. and have basically an AI coach for all things. And this is, I like how you described it as, you know, digitizing this outer world and uh, all of our gadgets and gizmos and mechanics and automation stuff. And now this inner world, modern well-being, is like how can we leverage these incredible computational capacities for doing things like 
like this idea of like mood or this idea of education or self-actualization mm -hmm. or and longevity, right? Exactly, and, and, yeah. Yes, and these are wonderful things and horrible things. Um, because if you look at the last two eras, right, the autonomous world, actually all, all the eras, many of them have been co-opted. And, you know, they're either owned by the 1% or they have become the 1%. The promise of the collective owning these things actually hasn't panned out. And, and I've seen this pattern enough times. Yes. So we actually need to question when we are collecting this bio data around us or the mood data or emotion data, who's using it and how, you know, is it really free if I get these services in this app? We really need to start questioning that because that is a concern. Agreed. There's a big gap that we still need to fill that for right now it's that we own none of our data. And in the future, we want to all own our data, own data, and be able to control the, anonymize it, and uh, send it up for processing, but mm -hmm. also open up these flows. And Or is it going to be all completely transparent? Is it going to be quantumly encrypted? There's all these questions that are mm -hmm. being asked. Or, it's like, what we, do you have to hide? Or we're going to restructure like the way we think about ownership. I mean, who really owns the air? I mean, data is the like air. the air. Yeah. Data is like air, right? In, yeah. We're breathing it in, we're adding to it, we're, we're extrapolating from it, we're using it, the trees are adding, who owns it? And, and data might be that pervasive too, so it's, it, yes, I know there's air rights in places like Manhattan. Yes, I know there's air quality within certain, I get that. Uh, but who really owns that air in this room? I, yeah, I this don't know. Is, this, is a, this is a question, this is a great question. Maybe the, the, the answer of this could be like nature or something. Mm -hmm. And then would you then be able to say something like, you know, maybe f f like f Facebook having this Oculus that, be that brings me into a world in a couple of decades that's completely indistinguishable Correct. from this world. Uh, do they then become my nature and they then own the air in the sense? And so that's a big question to ask. A digital twin of this reality, right? Yeah. Yes. And, yeah. and those are things that are that's going to happen on our generation as well. Yeah, and, and designer realities as well, ones that don't look anything like this mm -hmm. uh, planet, uh, this digital twin of the planet, because um, people are so creative. And if I can manipulate bits faster than I can manipulate atoms, I'm going to just click and delete this pillow faster than, like, how do I delete this physical pillow? Like, you know, and then I just want to jump between these designer virtual worlds. And so for my inner well-being, I want to do things like, let's give, let's give some good examples for, for, for the audience. Sure. Um, well, let's talk about data types because that is what is driving the apps and then the business models for, for better or for worse. It's just that is like a trigger. And, and that's why I'm often, I am a tech analyst. So the tech triggers something and it's unfortunately it's not the other way around where it's what is our needs then let's develop the technology usually it's here's a technology let's figure out how it impacts society and, oops we made a mistake there which has happened many times in tech okay um all right so the common ones now are kinetic movement right so tracking your movement yes. and location and then the second is heart rate so people are using this and um, there was a report recently from stanford partner with apple and they use um, heart rate variability data yes. to track it to see if people had irregular heart murmurs and this was to help stave off um, heart attacks and other cardiac diseases. I think that's a wonderful thing. Um, of course, there's also genomics and genetics tracking. I'm not an expert in that space, but that's a way if everybody c collectively contributes to that is to help um, predict disease, if not fight it. Um, so that's an interesting thing as well. Yeah, yeah. And I'm... Hoping that with the inner well-being um, digital era that we're currently mm -hmm. um, that we're currently getting into, that I hope that um, people can be creative longer and uh, flourish better on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. Uh, and I, and I hope that AI coach can just like come in and say, you know, hey, Alan, uh, you know, you're only going to get six hours of sleep if you go to bed right now, like. You know. Right. So that's, in a way, starting to happen. Who knows more about you? Um, Apple, well, I don't know what device system you're on. Yeah, but, Apple or Google. Okay, or Apple or Google or your doctor. It's, right? Oh, I think right now it's really clear that, uh, yeah, yeah the so, tech knows way more. And most people see their doctor, more. healthy people see their doctor once a year, if that, and they take yeah. a quick snapshot yeah, of their yeah. body with uh, their physical. Yeah. 
yeah. if they if they do that, many people are averse to that. But they're so willing to give up this bio data, a tremendous amount of bio data, that we don't even. For example, there's sensors in the Apple Watch that they haven't told us about yet. So we think there's oxygen level data that's already being pooled, and there is just a lot of in your blood. Yeah. And breath data can be tracked by the movement, um, micro movements, as you wear earbuds too. Mm, right, so yeah. that so there's a tremendous amount of information. Uh, so yes, an eight to bring bring that back. An AI coach to it's like a therapist, it's a doctor, it's a pharmacist, it's a, it's a psychologist. <laughs> all of, it's a mentor, it's a friend, it's all those things. But but is that is that the human condition that we want? Should should we be relying on those devices and that tech? I mean, some people are developing anxiety right now if they see, uh-oh, I only have a yellow band versus a green on the amount of sleep I had last night. I'm going to have a pretty crappy day today. A self-fulfilling prophecy of anxiety, right? You know, and some people have anxiety if they don't get enough steps in. So there were this unique reliance on technology is creating adverse effects as well as beneficial ones. Mm -hmm. So again, it's fire. Which way do we want yeah. to use it? I love your perspective on that. It's actually integrating um, philosophy into your synthesis of technology and being an, um, an industry analyst. And, and what you get by doing that is you get the, the question of, of, can you identify all of those instances when people uh, feel like the AI coach is absolutely helping them significantly and other instances when maybe it's actually um, hurting them in some way and so mm -hmm. um, I think that's a that's a that's a really tough question and, and uh, how do we find the data as the answer that's the fifth one then there's the sixth one we kind of we started getting into the VR one a little bit the digital mm -hmm. realities but there's also going off the, the planet. sixth era yes so going back to our original framework and this one's fuzzy and we're just kind of tracking it but it's called off world or off planet or off the planet and um, it started with obviously there's SpaceX and um, a number of organizations and Blue Origin that are trying to get humans off the planet but the trend that I was tracking is now satellites are now being shared yeah uh, and this is wonderful and scary at the same time and we're seeing that Amazon wants to enable a shared satellite network that could be the data can be pulled down to the Amazon cloud yes. and businesses or maybe individuals could purchase that data so how could that be used um, right now if, if somebody like many people are spending money on Nest or Arlo or Google Home that, mm -hmm. for security how much would somebody pay to have a satellite watch their house at night and if there were people intruding, we would automatically call the authorities. You know, so I'll, I'll bet you that'll be a use case, and people will will pay that. Or a drone fleet, also. It's not as efficient as the satellites as that satellites are already up there. Yes, they're already scanning millions of properties. And they have yeah. infrared, and they can see through clouds and smoke. And so it could be used for disaster recovery. It could use to be tracked the agri agricultural um, health. Uh, you could actually look at supply chain, like say, I, I said I purchased beef from this farm, how are those animals being treated? You could potentially zoom in. Yes, yes. And or you could see which countries or companies are actually, are they upholding their promise to the environment? You can zoom in on their factories or their plants and, and actually see that and which, where is pollution coming from and what is the state of the conditions of the oceans or whatever. It, so the amount, in real time, right, uh, not just a snapshot. So that level of detail is starting to come, and so that's as much as yes. I'm looking into this space. Uh, so the, so the, the big trend across all six of these things is that every aspect of, and that's outer space, right? Yeah. yeah. And so every aspect of the world and society is becoming digitized, and people are making sense of that, creating powerful AI, so there's a, a tremendous, tremendous amount of information that's being found and then people are creating businesses for good and bad uh, and it's just accelerating the world in amazing ways in scary ways hopefully you're hearing the duality out of me of course yeah, yeah. the philosopher within you well yeah. I, I don't yeah. consider myself that but it's you know it you have to look at it because the yeah, promise is right yeah. when social media first uh, arrived and I was very active in the scene here in Silicon Valley 15 years ago we say like, this is gonna make the world free and transparent and um, and everybody will have a voice. And then we found out that it has significant political ramifications, like that we can see it right today, right? Yeah, and, yeah. and the world, yeah. so there's- And mental health and well-being ramifications. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. And, and to and negative. I have, most of the social network apps are deleted off my phone right now. Exactly, likewise, yeah. yeah.
we know that th we're more likely to just get distracted uh, by them from our uh, ideal uh, North Star pursuit than from uh, than just you. Oh, I s I'm just gonna just post one thing, and it's always something. And then you're addicted hey, to that. Yes, and, exactly. And uh, I also like the way that Benioff is, is actually kind of stepping up and talking about uh, the future of capitalism, um, mm -hmm. being around uh, technology, basically doing what you're talking about right now, which is identifying when fire is being used in the best purposes to cook our food and to warm our houses and stuff like that rather than burn mm -hmm. uh, each other. And I think he is a model. He is a model leader. Yeah. Yes, I agree with that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and in, in, and in many ways, um, you know, uh, you know what uh, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates have done or like um, what uh, the Chan Zuckerberg initiative is trying to trying to do as well. I think I think these things are um, it's not clear exactly how as in the six digital eras, <clears throat> there's been a massive accumulation of wealth for a few for a few. But the standard of living has also gone up for those as well. It's not clear if the bottom has rised faster. It's, it's actually pretty clear that the top has rised faster, but the bottom's slowly rising too. But the ones that go all the mm -hmm. way to the top, it's not clear how to best uh, use those resources in order to maximize civilizational prosperity. And so we're kind of running permutations creatively to figure out Okay, well, probably not just giving the government the money. There's going to be a lot of other stuff that happens there that's, that's, but also not hoarding it and buying six yachts. Okay, 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 we're starting to feel it out. Maybe little like private public partnership organizations that focus heavily on a specific objective, like like mapping the inside of a cell or figuring out what it's at the center of the black hole or mapping the whole chemoelectroconnectome or uh, eradicating Alzheimer's. There's like, whoa. So like, you know, how do we do that? How do we run those little tiny uh, of uh, the, the wealth creation that's happening from the, the six digital uh, eras is, and, and how we can best uh, collaborate. This kind of goes to your first point about I, so collective. I, yeah. I really agree with your the way you, you described it, that the overall the collective good has gone up, and I agree with that. Uh, and it's also brought awareness to areas that are not being lifted up. But, but we should also remember that only half of the planet is on, on the internet, so we, we still have a significant digital divide. I was anticipating we would talk about this, so I'm glad that we did. Good. Uh, Let's hear more of your thoughts. Yeah, about I, very. There are a few that are extremely wealthy, and they will remain wealthy. I, I don't see that changing. In particular, the sharing economy. I was part of this small group. Of, of true believers, optimists that, you know, had this idea that the, it would decentralize all power. And I, I said that didn't happen in the social media space. It actually created a new class of one percenters, Mark Zuckerberg and Jack Dorsey and the investors in those companies. And it happened again. So that I seeing that, I'm seeing that pattern replicate. Um, it is. So having a reward for innovation and entrepreneurs who take great risk is a great thing. Um, but at what level uh, do, do they need that and, and make sure that the... So right now, um, to, I created a, a post talking about the class system that we have. And we actually have... Um, it, it, we really do have this, like, this medieval caste system. So at the highest level are the, the kings. And in today's society in Silicon Valley, that is the investors. The kings would grant the land to the lords, which would be the castle, and that which they can run that feudal system. And then from there, um, those are the entrepreneurs, and they create their little castles and kingdoms. And if they invite you to come be workers, then you can. Now, if you cannot identify with the lord or the king, which is the investor or the CEO, then you are a peasant or a pawn or at the very le bottom level, and, and so or or me and, and as well. So. That exists yet again. It's digital feudalism. Damn. Yeah. Wow. Whoa. Wow. It's in, in this kind of this, the same way you portray this digital feudalism. Uh, <clears throat> I think other we've also had this conversation about modern day slavery that I'm not. What do you mean freedom? What freedom are you talking about? We we spend 50% of our waking hours working for people to make money to pay for things 
that we don't even necessarily need sometimes. Uh, and so yes, there's a whole that is very true. there's a whole that ecosystem of modern estate plus this digital feudalism that's happening where it's like <clears throat> just telling someone you yeah, buckle up and go and you know become an entrepreneur. It's like how does that actually happen uh, in today's in today's world? And it's like every day have your ideas and make them. Have your ideas and make them day after day after day after day and after ten years maybe your ideas will still be around and people will find them to be very valuable and then you can start getting a little bit of money and you can start getting a little bit of a team and then you know that's kind of like this dream that we paint of mm -hmm. creativity and entrepreneurship now but there's still a serious hierarchy serious mm -hmm. hierarchy present i don't think that's going to change unless there's serious changes uh, at the highest federal levels, and, but you, you think can, federal levels? You think that like uh, could could certain aspects like uh, the decentral the future of decentralization technologies could potentially open up like the way that the current Federal Reserve has like a choke on our throats uh, on money, and now in ten years you're like whoa Bitcoin Ethereum cryptocurrencies mm -hmm. is like uh, so interestingly enough all of a sudden that they're like, oh God, we're losing our grip on that, which is kind of interesting. So maybe there's other ways that people have the grips and have built out big moats that are going to collapse because of mm -hmm. technologies like that. It's, it's, so I think that was it. Cryptocurrency is the first wave we saw as a test. There's going to be something else that emerges. That, that was just a test. <laughs> something else will happen. Um, I mean, um, we learned a lot from that. That was helpful. Um, but even without getting too political, the, the, a number of the political democratic candidates in the, in the United States espouse the, the beliefs of shared uh, wealth, and many of them want to regulate big tech so as their positions and platforms. Whether they do or not is a whole other topic, yeah. or if they get elected. But you can see that starting, or Andrew Yang, who is on your show, and I've sat down and had coffee with him, uh, so he believes in that as well. So you can see at least three candidates are starting to bring that up. In, in the ecosystem. So I think this conversation will only continue is, in, is yeah. reducing the digital divide yes. amongst the, the masses. Yes. Uh, yes. So we'll see. Yes, yes, yes. This is another um, uh, potentially an, actually an interesting um, industry report uh, to create or for other people um, to create is uh, around a wealth accumulation from the six uh, digital eras. Oh, it's pretty, yeah. Well, I, I, the patterns are already clear to me. But and, and then also the, um, the optimal formats of uh, allocating, reallocating resources towards collective prosperity. How, what is the maximization protocol, the best objective function? And that's a, that's a great question. Actually, I want to ask you that exact question. What do you think mm. is the purpose of the human experience? Wow, that's very deep. I'm, and I don't feel like I know... That's a very good question. I, I don't have a, an insightful answer. I'm still trying to figure out what that is like. And if you were to maybe think about your own pursuit and your own towards your own North Star in this world, what has given you the most idea of what is the meaning of your life and your existence? So bigger than just work or looking at trends? Um, I, I personally love challenges, and I think, mm. I think there's, the growth comes in the pain and the struggle and the suffering. Uh, for example, when you picked up my backpack, you noticed there's a bunch of weights in there. 25 pounds? Uh, that loadout is 20 pounds, and, and, yeah. and that it makes my bones denser and, and gives me mm. better posture and, and strengthens my muscles. And it's annoying to pick it up, but then after a while you forget it's there, and it's just because party. So I love the, the testing and, and the... Uh, on, on how to accomplish new things. And so I, I just love that part of the human conditioning is um, suffering for growth. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I like that, like challenges. The challenges, like uh, um, I, I had a corporate job, but I've been independent for 10 years. So I took the risk to go be an entrepreneur, which is kind of the norm around here in the Bay Area. But that was a risk. It put my family at risk, put me at mm -hmm. risk. I didn't know if it was going to work, um, but I do love those types of challenges to, to try that. What has been um, your relationship with 
source or God or all that is, or yeah, what has been your connection to this higher essence? I think a lot about the collective. In the, I mean, that, if you look at the, the thread of all of the research I've done is like, how are we connecting as, as one unit? Uh, but I'm looking at how, uh, how we're all one interconnected. That, that's, and I'm not really able to articulate it as well as I am in a tech market because it's not something I'm asked very often. Actually, probably one of the most important principles of that source or God or all that is conversation is literally interconnectedness mm -hmm. of all things. That's all things, and all not things, just humans. Not just humans. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And okay. And how about um, you have four young children? I have three. Three. You have three. Three children. Um, Are any of them the teenage yet? No. They're very young. They're very Below young. Below 10 ish. Yeah. Okay. What would you recommend for your own children and for those watching and their children um, for some sort of a way to succeed in this uh, the digital technology explosion into society? Mm -hmm. and, and, and beyond just tech. Uh, so I'm trying to teach my young ones and other kids as well is the ability to learn. Mm -hmm. So all of the, inf the information is there and it's going to be public and there's vast amounts of it. But being able to discern what really matters and then able to make those decisions is going to be key and to quickly learn. So I've been teaching my children like how to learn and constantly learn and relearn um, rather than just relying on uh, rote memorization, which is traditional in American, well, that's changing now in American public schools when I grew up and perhaps when you grew up, but uh, now they're starting to teach them how to find their own ideas. And I think that's a, a change that we need to embrace in society because things are moving more dynamically and the pace of change is accelerated in all aspects um, from politics to the environment to sustainability to societal issues and technology new releases they're moving at a faster everything's yes. oscillating at a faster pace the frequencies have gotten higher and higher now yes. right where versus 100 years ago the frequencies were lower bands yeah. right so yeah. we're moving into the upper registers and it's it is a lot of tension yeah. so you have to teach the children to quickly jump from wavelength to wavelength that are oscillating at a fast pace Damn. Uh, and it is stressful and, and that is what to do it so to answer your specific is 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 learning in multidisciplines. Yeah. So um, I'm I'm encouraging and inviting my children to learn from at least in, in outside of school in at least three domains. One is STEM. So one of my yeah. children is already playing with Lego robotics, right? And we do math together and science. And then the other one is um, is is fitness or, and movement and taking care of your body, the physical sense. Yeah. So we participate in things related to that. And the third one is the humanities. And we do art or dance or music. Or we play piano. Uh, and so I try That's to great. have that different disciplines together. And we're always learning from those as well. Yes. And if there's something that can combine all of them, that would be amazing. And yes. it's pretty yes. rare. But yes. Yes. So that's uh, the specific um, way I think about that. I love that and have maybe the, the two kind of ebb into maybe the humanities a bit and have the two other ones I've been to the fitness one a little bit into the stem one a bit just to like you know grow the overall multidisciplinary whole human, whole human, whole human. tool belt yes. for them um, I also like how you talked about it as an overall over time ascend ascension process and the frequencies increasing um, and in a sense it kind of reminds me like oh people are like oh you Young people can't uh, attention. They can't focus on thing. Well, there may be some sort of a, of a truth to like, yeah, long periods of focus on specific objectives that you want to solve. That's totally true. But at the same time, in the sense with this ascension that we're talking about, to be like vigilant of okay, I'm focusing my time on this thing, but then something else comes up. Am I able to quickly and efficiently switch? to the thing that I have to focus on now to solve this other big challenge in a completely different field. That's also the other thing. Mm -hmm. Could it be even in a completely different field and then to 
go back while managing other people in my own health and working with this AI coach all at the same time. So you have to, in a sense, be able to hold a bunch of different things in your worldview, tons mm -hmm. of variables. And this next generation may not even think of it as switching, like mental switching. It's I think that's actually how they, they kind of grow up, yes. is just multi-channel on all the time. Like they probably, three screens on at a time, right? Yes. You know, what, a, a real wearable device, phone, laptop, and then, and phone, yeah. I don't even think they're gonna use a laptop. It's probably a, AR, a AI, a verbal based AI, uh, right? Yeah which is that's voice. where amazon is pushing his voice and audio yeah right and then they have the mobile device which in itself is disappearing and dissipating as well amazon last week announced or two weeks ago announced that they have uh, glasses now which have six microphones on them right so you can see and they have you know you can see where this is, is going it's going, yeah. it's going all around us but and the screens are slowly dissipating away yeah correct exactly getting yeah, it's mm -hmm. all yeah. Voice uh, um, playing in these three D environments with my voice in my hands. That's right. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So Pretty screens big. disappear. Yeah. That, I think yeah. that's like what we will know when we truly are mo mobile first, as we don't even see the mobile device, and, mm. and so that that's where we're headed. And there's so many other incredible reports that you guys have that we could talk about, but I, I just high, highly recommend people to, to go to the website and check them out, web-strategist.com, um, Kaleido, Kaleido Insights. Kaleido, like Kaleidoscope. Kaleidoinsights.com Kaleido mm -hmm. um, and your Twitter profile as well. Um, check out those reports. They are so incredible. And check out the blog posts, everyone. They're so, so good. Um, another one was on like autonomous vehicles. Another one was on... Um, uh, what the corporate? I guess we would we wouldn't we have to at least ask you this question as well. I, sure. I forgot to ask you. Um, what are corporations doing inside of uh, their uh, buildings, inside of their um, uh, processes that are facilitating the greatest amount of innovation development? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> let's use a metaphor. So the corporations are traditionally like large stone blocks, immobile rigid, cold. Now they're realizing they need to be more like um, a redwood forest. Still strong, but they bend in the wind and they hold host to many other organisms, many which are unseen beneath the soil. And they enable life around them in a, in a connected ecosystem. And, and so that's the mindset shift that they realize they need to behave like the tech startups. If you look at the popular tech startups, they enable life around them. For example, Facebook, who's creating the content? Everybody else but Facebook. They're enabling that. Apple, who creates the apps? Not really Apple. Uh, you know, their, their primary revenue line is selling phones. Second is the app store and iTunes. Uh, and you can go on and on. And Uber, who's actually doing the work? The crowd, Airbnb. Whose homes are they? The crowd. So, but in order to do that, they need to be agile, nimble, and have, in a way, a mindset of... Um, enabling the ecosystem and lifting up the ecosystem around you mm. rather than being the sole um, beneficiary. Themselves. Yes, that's right. Interesting. So like the moving from the stone to the red wood to, to deal with um, all of the wind of the, the movement for the tree, but also as a redwood, then maybe doing something like creating shade for others to come. Exactly. Stuff like that. Exactly. And, yeah. and the, it's an interconnected ecosystem, right? And even there's life under the soil and they're, and they're exactly. connected to other organizations and even to other large companies. So everything's becoming connected through digital and it's get, to get specific APIs and, and data, right? And so that's resulting in this, the resilience. So um, to, to be very specific, Big companies are trying to be agile and nimble, right? That, and there means they have to be welcome to trying new things that often result in failure. And that is very yeah. difficult. Traditionally, if a stone breaks, it splinters in half and, they, and it feels not very great. I don't know how stones feel, <laughs> but I'm just trying to take that metaphor a little as far as I can. And so yeah. failure was not really an option for these big corporations. And now they're realizing they have to place lots of 
tiny little bets and, yes, and, yes. and do that. So and they're then, running the permutations, the creative permutations, yes. but also they're creating uh, platforms that enable other people's creativity mm -hmm. to come through them. That's right. And that could be either their own employees with a innovation, entrepreneurship program. Intrapreneurship. Intrapreneurship. Which is like if they have that day off every week, <clears> uh, like Friday off. It should be infused throughout the, the whole process. So it shouldn't be just oh, separated. Oh, interesting. Not just a day off, but maybe right. uh, while you work, whenever you feel like it, transition to the Not transition. It should be part of always growing the existing product. Yeah. So ah, when okay. you when you talk to the, the big tech startups, Google, Amazon, Uber, they don't have innovation departments. The big traditional company have innovation departments run by a specific person because they were not innovative to begin with. So like it, an automotive manufacturer that's right, or something. Because they're used to just slight permutations on each product, which was part of the product roadmap. That's actually yeah. not innovation. That's just okay. permutations. So innovation to create something completely new, uh -huh. th that comes from another group. And it's because they have uh, been disrupted by the tech startups. Let me give you a practical example. Yeah. The car companies are now doing a ride sharing or car sharing, or they're preparing for rides as a service, so you can order them through an app on, on a membership. They're preparing for that because Uber disrupted them five years ago so badly <laughs> that they realized that they themselves need to become innovative. Yeah, and yeah. so they're now thinking, oh, in the future, we don't sell cars. We're just offering a mobility service. Yeah. Wow. So that's innovative thinking wow. versus product iteration is, ah, oh, we need to make the ride more comfortable. Ah, oh, we need to have more miles per gallon. Oh, we need more comfortable seats. Yeah, yeah. That's not innovation. That's just iteration. Mm -hmm. So they actually had to be completely dis intermediated by Uber and Lyft or car sharing or ride sharing for them to realize, oh, wow, we have to really think a lot different. Whoa, so it's a pressure cooker sometimes happens and then the, the, it goes from iteration to innovation. That's right. And so the definition we use of innovation, we interviewed people with that title, is doing something new that solves customer needs and it's probably in conflict with your existing business model. <laughs> I love the last part. Yeah. That serves the customer's needs, but then it's also in conflict with the existing business model. Yeah, because right. that, that's kind of what it feels like when we also take on something uh, else is, is like, uh, in a sense, it's like, oh, but we're focusing so much of our attention here and uh, we're making, you know, 80% of our revenues from just the 20% of stuff here. We want to keep focusing on it, but it's like, yeah, but then you have your blinders on to what all these other possibilities are that if you uh, hedged a bunch of different bets, that one of those could become your next 1% of the time that's right. that makes 90% of your revenue. Or that's more. right. Yeah. And so that's why it can't be just something you do once a day inside of a company. That, that, that culture of innovation has to be infused through the whole organization. Like you'll see this in the, um, the leadership principles at Amazon. You'll see this at the Google 80-20 rule, which is what you're sort of referencing. You'll see this at Adobe with their entrepreneurship programs. So yeah, so it's starting to take hold in, in, in other organizations as well. I love that. So it, entrepreneurship is actually a very crucial principle of innovation, mm -hmm. especially at these bigger yes. corporations. Yeah. And so that means that the ideas come from all levels of the, of the company, not just from product managers. Yeah. It can be from any employee. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So that's part of this whole Back to the, the bigger theme here is the connectedness and how the, the crowd is empowered and how we're all connected. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Whoa. Okay. And then um, just last, uh, last couple questions. Um, do you think that this is already a simulation? I, I love this topic. Um, and I've read the, the articles and I've listened to the, the podcast and I've watched the YouTube videos. And um, yeah, that's statistically, yeah, it's probably a simulation. We're probably not base layer, base layer, base uh, reality. Yeah, pro statistically, we're, it's not. But who am I to say? I was already programmed to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I love that that thought. Yeah. So, have you played Sim City? Oh yeah. Okay, yeah, so I love that game. And there's a, a moat, after you build your beautiful city, right, and it's got all these, you know, it, maybe it's in tune with nature, or maybe it's high tech, you can choose one of the disasters, right? Whether it's like UFOs or tornadoes or fires or riots. And it seems like this year, like, the player just 
hit a bunch of those all at once. We have everything but the UFOs coming here. Yeah. I guess that's next. <laughs> You have to be a geek to really know to that's the, that metaphor. Yeah, yeah. The, actually uh, um, putting ourselves in that creator perspective of the reality is one of the best ways, I think also for kids, one of the best skills for them because then they gain this worldview understanding. Exactly, yeah. looking at systems and patterns and holistic yes. and the connectedness. That's exactly right. That is a great Sid Meier's uh, also civilization. Yeah. That's yeah. a great way to look at yeah, that as well. Way. Like, look from look down on the universe and on our planet and on civilization and how everyone's behaving and stuff from the top from the top down and then see that systems perspective see the interconnectedness mm -hmm. perspective yeah, and look yeah. bottom up from like the like plonk to the atom mm -hmm. like up yeah. yeah 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 and that's tied too like yeah. Even in this room, there's a tech system which layers up to the other tech systems in the other neighborhoods, which become the societal digital web, right? And which is the internet, right? So you can look at it both ways. Yeah. Yes. 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 And humans are right in the middle between the smallest and the biggest. We're right in the middle. Last question What do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? new life mm. why that is our core instructions and core DNA code is to create new life yeah I mean it's it, when you look at the human behavior um, it, it's it's to procreate and I don't just mean yeah, yeah. I don't just mean to have children yeah. you know it's to to help other people um, grow as well, or, yes. or it's plants, or it's, or, it's, or it's a pet. Like, we get so much joy out of new life. New life. It, it is part of our yes. core instruction yes. and survival instinct. Yes. I mean, it's yes. those that couldn't do it are not here in all parts of biology, right? Yeah. And the ecosystem. So I think that's beautiful. Ooh, on the hierarchy of priorities, new life is probably at the top. Uh, you know, of course, you get the air and the water and the, the food, but you know, making new life and being with new life is. Mm -hmm. And you get three of them at your your mm -hmm. own new life that yes, you get. Yeah, yeah, I do yeah. do, and that is yeah. uh, that that is a joy, and it and it does things to you that I oh, just yeah. yeah. Being a dad uh, is one of the coolest experiences of life, and, or and a mom, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then especially when they have kids and you become a grandpa or a grandma. Hold on there. Uh, yeah, but, <laughs> but then you really see yeah. the cycle of life That's happening, right. and then you're like, whoa. Yeah, yeah. Jeremiah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That was so deep a conversation. Oh, that was so, so great. Thank you. I'm so happy. You have incredible knowledge about society and technology and capacities to synthesize and disseminate, which is something that we love so much. So this has been an honor for us as well. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Have more conversations with your friends, families, coworkers, people online about society and technology, about all of these systems, about the interconnectedness of them and about the future of them and about how you yourself can become more actualized and collectively actualized together. Check out all the links in the bio below, webstrategist.com, also kaleidoinsights.com and uh and also jeremiah's twitter profile go and check out those industry reports they are incredible they'll give you extremely valuable insights go check those out everyone also shout out to ori shapira our co-producer thank you very much ori greatly thank appreciate you. it and also support the artists the entrepreneurs the leaders in your communities and organizations that you believe in because you can support us too. Look below. Look in the links below. Support us. Help us grow as well. Help all those leaders grow around you. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace.